Welcome back to This is Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. With me today, I have Professor Bola Kintenewa, Professor of International Relations at the Achievers University of Ondo State. Professor Kintenewa is in our Abuja studio. And here in Lagos with me, I have Professor Anthony Kila, Professor of Strategy and Development and Institute Director at the Commonwealth Institute of Advanced and Professional Studies, CIAPS as well as Professor David Awurawu, Professor of International Relations and Strategic Studies at the University of Lagos. Thank you uh, for joining us. Let's start with uh, uh, Professor Akintenwa, who is in Abuja. Prof, we have had uh, two guests on this pro program today. The release of the, uh, well, we are not sure, 287, 137, 150, of the people who were abducted uh, in Kuriga, uh, Kaduna State, um, and the Kaduna State government has been celebrating that this is quite an achievement, even if we don't know the exact number. And then, of course, uh, we also had uh, Professor Benjamin Okaba, uh, Professor Benjamin Okaba, addressing uh, the uh, uh, subject of the crisis in the Niger Delta. It was Group Captain Sadiq Shew who discussed the uh, you know rescue of the pupils and staff of the LEA GSS Secondary School of uh, Kuringa in, uh, in Kaduna State. Let's start with you, and then we'll come back to the Abuja, uh, the Lagos studio for Professor Awurawo and Professor Kila. Thank you, Ruben. Um, group Captain Said Shew, retired, spoke on three main issues. The first one is on the exact number of um, students or pupils that were affected. The second issue he raised uh, that I took note of is the issue of uh, ransom pain. And then the third one, which is his response to your question on what to do, the advice he should give. Now, to begin with, my major problem it's not about any government rejoicing. What has actually happened, we have not been told. You see, this idea of uh, giving us a half truth is why Nigeria has been unable and is not likely to be able to make any headway in terms of um, development of culture of truth. First of all, when we are talking about uh, um, those kidnapped being freed, that is the word that we have used on, on our screen. Freed, they were freed. The government will tell us whether these people were released or they were rescued because uh, group captain Said Chew differentiated between uh, four types of negotiation. He told us about uh, negotiated um, release, negotiated release uh, based on um, government either surrounding them, overcoming them, and now compelling them to, to accept. He gave us the example of uh, the possibility of um, the kidnappers uh, getting tired. They, they are, either they are hungry, there is no water for them, and they quickly surrender. And he also talked about um, hosted rescue operation. You see, all these uh, categories, he was not able to categorically tell us what transpired. Were they rescued? Did the military actually fight? He also gave us an idea that, look, the likelihood he even carefully told us that he is not telling us that government had paid any ransom. But he gave us other arguments, pointing to the fact that doing a deductive um, um, analysis that the government must have negotiated. Because in this case, he's saying, if, for instance, the, the victims are already within the prison yard, the entourage of the kidnappers, the extent to which you can easily escape uh, is remote. 
All this he said. Now, the beauty of it all is that he said we should stop lip service. And I think that in this case, I am of the opinion that um, if we are to address meaningfully this issue of how to stop on a permanent basis or on an enduring basis, the issue of attendance, which he partly raised, must be addressed. Every school must ensure that before classes begin, there is a summary list, you know, of all the classes indicating who is present, who is absent. And on that basis, they can have a good idea of how many people are in the class. The need for technological alert system, which he also partly raised, uh, is needed. Having perimeter fence is one thing, but in uh, the modern day, you know, the civilized way of um, ensuring security, safe school, is easy. Government needs to invest on technology alert system with or without perimeter fence. You see, what people do in advanced countries, you don't see the policemen, you don't see security people, radar is there. Now what prevents Nigeria from having satellite um, surveillance in, in all these places in such a way that, in fact, I am so much interested in the observation and in the, in the style of gesticulation of uh, Ruben Nabati when he was saying that, look, how would you have uh, 287 people, the human beings, and at the end of the day, they will be carted away as if they are carrying 10 boxes of uh, Kronombu beer, as if they are ca uh, carrying uh, boxes of um, chickens, people all along, and nothing will happen. So you see something, the question that was asked, what really is wrong with Nigeria? We all know, and I've been talking about that. Please, you see, it is management of dishonesty. The system is very dishonest, very corrupt. Please, we have been told that in, in, in Nigeria, here, people know where, people know where all these uh, kidnappers, terrorists are. Gumi, Gumi told Nigerians, the whole world, openly, that all the security agencies do know where all these kidnappers are. How? He said they are accompanying him to the venue of uh, negotiations. So please, at the end of the day, taking Nigerians too much for granted is a problem. Professor Benjamin Okaba, I also liked um, the, the, the point he raised or the answer he gave to you on the current situational reality in uh, Okoloba uh, and other communities. And he specifically said, well, we can talk about relative peace, but based on intelligence um, sources reaching him about six hours ago, we cannot scientifically argue, we cannot posit that there is a uh, peace returning. He doesn't believe in that one. And since he is a primary source in this particular case, I want to predicate my own observation on the basis of his own primary source. Now, we need to address certain issues. How can you expect, for instance, um, the Nigerian policemen, the, the military, how they, they are going on a mission, and then they will be promoting togetherness. That is, they are always together. If you are traveling from Lagos, you are going to Ore, you are going to the East, go and see how the Nigerian policemen behave. All of them will be in the same place, in such a way that if the enemy is coming at a distance, can fire all of them and kill them. It is not done. 
in uh, some developed countries, especially in France, for instance, the gendarmes always move in two. They call them Ibeji, that is twins. They are two. They are always in motorcycles. They, some will be monitoring, acting, fully armed. Others will be far away. Monitoring who will dare attack all of them. I think this is one style, you know, this culture of togetherness must be reviewed. Now, you know, this particular killing, this issue of um, killing of soldiers, it raises a fundamental question on um, legitimate self-defense of the military. In this case, why should anybody, whether he is reasonable or he is not reasonable, why should anybody kill someone who is going on peace purpose? I use the word peace purpose. I don't want to say peace mission. Because the issue is that we have been told that they are going there to help maintain peace, which means that they are actually going on peace enforcement, not just peace mission. Now, how can you go in a convoy? Doesn't the military have, for instance, a strategy, military policy of containing um, ambush attacks? They don't look at that one. The Yoruba people have, you know, posited, have given to humanity one proverb, asakpa madenikim beniku. It simply means that somebody who is hiding on the way, you are going on the path in a dark place, you are going freely, but you don't know who is hiding on the way. There must be a strategy to foresee, to look at what is most likely to happen. It's most unfortunate. Above all, and I conclude on that particular one, you see, when I was talking about legitimate self-defense, what really is the root cause what prompted the attackers, the reckless Nigerians that will kill our soldiers? No, I take an exception to the killing of any law enforcement agent, even though one will disagree with them, but it is not proper in a peaceful setting for anybody to kill somebody meant to come and help you. Now, but why did they kill the soldiers? Nobody is also addressing that. And that is why I'm drawing attention to it, to say, look, when they say there's no smoke without fire, there cannot be any fire without smoke this time. You can't kill the soldiers like that. We need to investigate, address the problems. That is the issue. No problem. Let's have a... Uh, Professor Awurawo's uh, take on these two subjects. Professor Awurawo. Yeah, um, I'd like to begin from where Professor Ketene was stopped, and that is uh, the uh, military. I think we are very glad to see him. Yes. <laughs> he's, uh, he's been, very he's glad been away for so yes, long. Yes, yes, um, and he's looking as uh, vibrant as ever. Uh, we, are, we are happy to you know, see him today. Um, yeah, so I would like to take off from where um, he stopped, and uh, that has to do with the soldiers. And, and I also want to uh, reinforce what he has said, that um, killing of security men, um, soldiers, policemen, ought most to be deprecated. Uh, killing of anybody, by, by the way, uh, needlessly, ought most to be condemned. Um, having said that, we need to look at everything that has happened and see what lessons we can learn. Um, I think uh, so many layers, so many in individuals involved in this matter made a lot of mistakes. The biggest mistakes, you know, have been made by those who kill those soldiers. Um, even if they disagree with them, why, why would killing them be the option? There are several options to, you know, explore to be able to resolve this, this issue. Um, and I would like to begin with the state government. Issues of uh, communal land dispute and all that should not be taken lightly because we understand that the issue has lingered for quite some time and efforts have been made to reach out to the government to intervene. But the government has not, uh, didn't promptly, you know, respond. So that has contributed to where, where we are now. 
so the government needs to pay attention, not just when something happens and the governor wants to go there and all that. Uh, if uh, that's what we talk about, early warning and prompt response, if that are taking place, it is almost certain that you know, this uh, needless and senseless killing will not have happened. The second is the response of the military. Um, they have been denying that they are not the ones who have uh, you know, carried out some burning of uh, places and uh, demolition of houses and all that. But they are the ones who have cordoned off and controlled the space. So who else could have come to that place where the military have taken charge and controlled the space to be able to bomb? Did they just stand and you know, cordon off the place, control the space, and allow some other people to come and burn down places there? So that argument too doesn't uh, seem to, I mean, it doesn't make sense. And the military needs to continue to exercise restraint. Uh, we'll talk about uh, OD, Zakibiam, and all that in the past. Uh, that approach should not be the approach that the military should adopt when things like this happen. They should work with the society to fish out those who have carried out this and not go killing innocent people on account of this. In fact, it's a disservice to trying to get them because when you go like this and you start killing people, those who have information that will have helped the military to track down these people will not give it. Everybody will not be angry you know, at the military. So it's a lose-lose situation. And the chances are that those who carry out this, they will not even be there. So if you go killing people there, it's almost certain that those you are killing are innocent people. So it, is, it, does, it, just, it also doesn't make sense that that should be the response, going to kill indiscriminately just because the, you know, one wrong has been committed. And then the operation itself, we need to interrogate it very quickly. Um, a battalion commander, a platoon commander, a company commander all left their base at the same time to go and resolve this matter. What we learn about military strategy, this is contrary to it. Who, who was at the, at the center of command and control? When all of them, the battalion commander left, the, left corner, the uh, platoon commander left, the company commander left, the, 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 the major unit. Yes. Mm. I mean, it's surprising. Uh, that, is, that is contrary to the military strategy as we know it. Uh, it is true that you can do everything right and you still suffer, you know, a loss. But if you do everything right, the chances that you suffer loss are reduced drastically. I think there was some recklessness in the way this operation was carried out. And again, if you want to go and mediate, did you contact the OVS, the Marcos, that's the older men of the place? Did you contact the state governor who has a special advisor on uh, 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 conflict resolution and community development? What about the DPOs of uh, Bomadi and... Uh, uh, you know, the surrounding areas. This, if, if it were more broad-based, it wouldn't have been like this. And there's also one report that they were shot when they were returning to the jetty. Where 16 military men going, everybody facing the same direction. Nobody was looking back. The whole thing is uh, very... Uh, when I met uh, President Boston just several times. If you see him walk, he doesn't walk straight. He always looks back. And most military men, I know that... Don't, don't, don't dis, uh, describe our baba. No, 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 no. He's, I'm he's telling you that he's a very smart yeah, yeah. and conscious of his environment. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he that takes to train, what yeah. Professor Akitari was just saying, that what was also the, the threat analysis, analysis of the threats of, in the place, that what you are likely going to encounter in going to this community, such that the way they were ambushed, that's what Professor Akitari was talking about. So uh, we are saying all of this so that uh, military men can you know, learn from all of the mistakes, such that things like this will not happen moving forward. It's not to disparage anybody, it's not to say, oh, people are incompetent, but you know, when mistakes are made, you learn from it and then you do better. For, as historians, we talk about the didactic advantage of history. Of when people do a certain kind of things, oh, what can we learn from it? That's why I'm commenting on a lot of this the way I have. Then the children that were kidnapped, yes, um, we, we, we are happy that they are released. No life should be lost needlessly. Uh, so um, we are happy that they have been released. The details of how many we were released, how many were not released, well, I won't want to go into that, but I would just want to reinforce what we said before, that the government needs to urgently go back to the safe school initiative and all the things that need to be done. Now that they are released, we are happy. All of a sudden, everybody goes to sleep until there's another you know, kidnap. That should not be the case. The government should take the safe school initiative seriously and ensure that the things contained in that framework are implemented. You know, it will reduce drastically the capacity for kidnappers to just come and kidnap the way they have done. And intelligence too, do, do the principals have the phone numbers of the police around, the military around? Because the way they came and carried these people, is embarrassing. At 8 a.m. Yes, it's embarrassing. And we, they will have come with so many you know, buses and all that to carry them. 
Within that period, they couldn't call some security agencies, the police, the military, and all that, to be able to you know, stop them. Even ordinary military men or security men passing, they didn't notice any strange movement. All of these things are things I think we need to address, such that while well, we are happy that these have been released, we are almost, almost certain that ransom will have been paid, but we can't confirm yet, but almost certain. Um, things to do to prevent a recurrence of this is they are the things we should focus on moving forward. Uh, Professor Killer? Well, um, starting from the issue of the military that were killed, I think we can all agree that any time uniformed men are killed, is either because the country is at war or because there is distrust and there is no fear of the military that were killed. There's no other way to put it. Um, from what we know, um, just, just on what we know, there was a, an operation indolently done and recklessly carried out. Students of military strategy will be very clear in their mind, you know, what you call pre-intervention analysis of anywhere you want to go. Clearly, these people have not followed that. I think moving forward, what needs to be done is a very deep investigation and probe into what actually happened in that place because the rumors that we're hearing, and I call it rumors because, or should we call it voices, because there is no official um, official position yet. The voices we're hearing is that the people in the community did not believe or did not know that those that came were official military men. They argue, some of them argue, that they've been attacked in the past by um, opponents who using bandits or using criminal to harass them dressed in military um, clothing. So their thinking was that these were thugs um, that were coming our way. My position is that, and this is all assumption, my position is that if the military had acted the, the right way, if they had consulted, informed all the right authorities and presented themselves following the handbook, perhaps some lives would have been saved. I think um, issues need to be investigated and the military, the police, all uniformed men needs to go back to dealing with situations as it is written in the handbook. We need to remind ourselves that you know those, those rules of engagement, those conduct of condu um, um, those um, rules of conduct were not invented just for um, you know for invention's sake. So you know uh, I think we need to really take that serious uh, as a way to operate to avoid things like this. That that is a very crucial thing for the kidnapping in Kaduna. We we have to be happy that some people have been returned. You know because it has happened before in this country that this did not happen. So. It's a step forward. The fact that we do not know the exact number is something that really worries me. It smacks of indolence or it smacks of mischief. It is not so difficult to know the number of people that were taken away that were returned. It's just a matter of counting. There's no school that will not know the number of students that are in or out. Any school that cannot do that is not fit for purpose. That is the path for indolence. My concern is mischief. I suspect some people are cooking up numbers either to make money, to cause panic, or for any reason in the world. And I think we need to start taking numbers as sacred and to know, again, just like the military, schools, you have very clear rules. You come into the class, register, um, you, you take attendance sheet, and at any time, anybody should know that. Nothing has been done for safety or not enough has been done. Mind you, how can you talk safety when a lot of the schools are not even functional? I hear people talk about putting... Um, radar or some kind of technical, advanced technological tools. These are schools where if you go in there, some of them don't have chairs. They don't even have the right board. I think we need to rediscover education, its importance. And while we're discovering it, we then need to think of security very seriously. Too many people in government do not have their children in these schools that are suffering. And that is part of the problem. The people who are elected, paid, and charged to deal with these issues are alienated from the issues they're dealing with. And that is why they cannot understand, they cannot empathize. And we must give, I repeat, you know, it's a good thing that this issue has been dealt with. Not completely well, not perfectly, but at least we've got some results from it. It's a step forward from where we were eight years, eight years or more ago when this kind of thing happened. To the issue of whether ransom is paid or not, the position of the president is the best position. You officially, as the expert said, you know, from Italy to Mexico, all over the world, best practices show. 
I dare say common, take, common sense dictates that the official position of a state should be no to negotiation. But in practice, operationally, that is different. For our viewers to understand, the official position of the church is not to fornication or adultery. But when you look around you, there are lots of single mothers inside there. You don't, you know, chase them out. The, the church has its positions, but the way they behave is something else. Now, here's the thing we need to understand, though, strategically thinking. The kidnappers have only two interests. Successfully kidnap people and successfully get whatever they want, whether it's finance or whether it's releasing their people in prison or any other thing they want, any kind of negotiation. The state, on behalf of the people, has three interests. One is to make it impossible to kidnap people. Two is to get people back if they're kidnapped. Three is to punish kidnappers. What that means is that the state is running a marathon. If the state is serious, whether they've given money or they've done some deals, the fact that they've done it does not make kidnappers safe. It's just a battle. If the state is serious, get people back and continue to monitor them till you get your thing. It's just about seriousness, competence, and commitment of the state. Okay, let's go to Gaza. I, mean, I have three professors of international relations with me. So let's go international. As the United Nations Security Council, failed to pass a U.S.-backed resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza as part of a hostage deal. The leading opponents were led by Russia and China's ambassador to the U.N., who said Beijing also supported an alternative resolution it viewed as more balanced. It went on to criticize the, next, the test proposed by the United States for not clearly stating its opposition to any military operation by Israel in Rafah, which he said could lead to severe consequences. He said if the United States was serious about a ceasefire, it would not have vetoed multiple previous Security Council resolutions. Thank you, President. The United Kingdom voted yes on the text before us this morning. We voted yes on the need for an immediate and sustained ceasefire to protect civilians, allow humanitarian aid in, and alleviate suffering. We voted yes on the call for an international humanitarian law to be upheld, for the release of hostages, to reject forced displacement, and to urge against a ground offensive in Tarafa. President, Palestinians are facing a devastating and growing humanitarian crisis, which will not improve until more aid can get in to Gaza. So we are deeply disappointed that Russia and China were unable to support this council well, there you have it. Uh, the, the United States uh, shifted its position. For the first time, the United States drew up a, a proposal, a proposed resolution, talking about immediate ceasefire towards the end of getting those stages uh, released. But Russia and China blocked it, despite the fact that 11 uh, out of the 15 members of the uh, Security Council voted in favor of the immediate ceasefire. Ambassador Greenfield, the UN uh, ambassador to the UN, uh, says, oh, this was for petty reasons, you know. So what do we have here? We know that if any of the big five vetoes anything, it doesn't fly. But there's another vote uh, scheduled for Monday, I think, tomorrow. Uh, you know, they re revise. Maybe the US will go there tomorrow too and say we are vetoing the alternative uh, resolution. What are we dealing with here? Uh, Professor Killer, let me start with you this time. Well, I think, you know, fortunately for the victims who are um, waiting for resolution, this is a chronicle of a um, of foretold chaos that we're having there because for on principle or ideologically, historically, these people always go against each other. If you understand what is going on there, it is a position of the country that said, if the U.S. was serious about this, they shouldn't have vetoed in the past other kind of resolutions that they do. So in a way, it is a proxy war that they're fighting among themselves. I think all sides are guilty of it. 
My position, if I was in that room, my position is that before presenting a proposal, they should have consulted among each other and proposed a compromise position or an arranged position that everybody will be able to vote on. But I think that is not the way they want to go to. My prediction is that they're going to go on the third voting to get something they will agree on. Professor Olawo. Well, um, you can see the, the, the Cold War enacted here now. Uh, the, the one that I think will work is not one that is proposed by either US, Russia, or China. Yeah. It will be one proposed by any other state, and then these countries support. Uh, it is, it's unfortunate because the US vetoed three previous ones that could have easily gone through yeah. if they hadn't vetoed the US and the United Kingdom. Um, anyone that the US, Russia, or China, pro, you know, any of them, uh, uh, proposes will likely be vetoed by the other because yes there is a co war going on there uh, the other states should you know present and then these states can now because china and uh, russia voted in favor of the previous ones but usa and uh, the united kingdom vetoed that is a retaliation uh, yeah so this is like a, it's not the, so much the contents of the uh, uh, draft uh, resolution as much as Oh, you did it before. And they even mentioned it that if the US were, were serious, it wouldn't have vetoed the previous, I mean, the previous side. So we hope that in the, in the week we have just entered today, uh, something will give such that we're able to get one that everybody will agree to uh, for the sake of the suffering people of Gaza. The comment by the uh, 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 ambassador of the United Kingdom to the United Nations reveals it. Uh, the suffering, uh, uh, respect for international law. Uh, what that means is that, you know, the way the war there has been conducted has not respect international law. Everybody knows that, uh, you know. So we hope that something that is acceptable to all will be presented this week and agreed to, such that, you know, the, the beginning of the peace process uh, in Gaza, of course, the broader Middle East uh, can commence. Okay, I'm going to uh, take uh, Professor Akinten later on this subject, but we'll go to the Abuja studio where we have a guest. Uh, to comment on another important uh, subject. And that's the uh, close of the uh, 13th African Games in Accra, Ghana. An eye-catching closing ceremony brings to an end the African Games in Ghana on Saturday after an eventful 16 days in Accra, Kumasi, and Cape Coast. On the final day of the competition, perennial champions Egypt claimed two more gold medals. To take their gold medals hall, to 101 to once again claim the top spot at the Continental Sports Showpiece event. The 13th edition of the African Games, which officially began on March 8, will be remembered for sporting excellence. Egypt emerged winners of the event with 189 medals, 101 gold, 46 silver, and 42 bronze, while Nigeria finished in second position with 47 gold, 33 silver and 40 bronze medals to claim a total of 120 medals. South Africa occupied the third spot with 106 medals, 32 gold, 32 silver, and 42 bronze medals, as Algeria ranked the fourth best country at the event in Ghana with 114 medals. Tunisia completed the top four with 87 medals, while Ghana, despite a poor start to the event, finishing sixth position with 19 gold medals, 29 silver, and 20 bronze medals. I'm now being joined by Diana Mary Nsan, who is a special advisor to Nigeria's Minister of Sports, John Eno. Good to have you on This Day Live, uh, Diana Mary Nsan. Uh, well, should I say congratulations? Good evening, doc Good evening Dr. Abati. Yes, thank you for joining us yeah, on this Yeah, we're excited, life. we're elated. Yeah, congratulations, <laughs> I know that. Thank uh, you. But we've been in this second position since uh, 1965. Second position, perpetually. <laughs> I mean, okay, yeah, okay, we got to uh, 120 medals. But are there lessons we can learn from Egypt so that we can overtake the Egyptians and then... Uh, at least uh, take the first position. I know our girls did very well. The men also did well in weightlifting, in boxing, in uh, 100 meters uh, orders with uh, Toby Amushon, 4x400 uh, women, and uh, Blessing uh, Oboro Dudu. You know, yeah, individual achievement. But this second position, how can we 
Just uh, at least overtake these Egyptians. <laughs> anyway, I see you are laughing. Okay, Dr. Abati. <laughs> yes, I think this is, this is um, first, this is the minister's, uh, this was the target the minister set out for, you know, to break this jinx and, you know, go beyond top the medal chart. But uh, this is how I think we are going to do it because most of the areas where Team Nigeria did record huge success were areas that followed and stuck to the plan. Uh, we had the Ministerial Podium Performance Team. Now, what this uh, performance team did was uh, pay attention to the training load management. Uh, also, and athletes who followed and stuck to that plan actually when, you know, in their apex form, they were in top form, athletics, wrestling, uh, weightlifting, uh, and boxing. Uh, we also had the team uh, members, uh, Professor Ken uh, Anukoje actually led that team, and they were on ground all through the duration of the, the, the games, you know, because it's a back and forth between members of the team. Professor Ken, by the way, is a, uh, leads or heads the High Performance Center in River State. So there was a back and forth, checking the training schedule, the feeding, the lifestyle of athletes, and... Although I would accept and I would agree that this possibly was set out for the Olympics because besides topping the, the medal charts for the African Games, you also have a target. The Honorable Minister of Sports also has a target that at the Olympics, Nigeria should come back home with medals, gold medals to be precise. So this team was set up to look into the technicalities, to pay attention to our athletes in terms of the proper things to do so that our athletes can be in top form. And of course, I could say that, um, or I can say that what we saw at the African Games, we would give some credit to the, 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 the team for the work that they've done. I had interactions with uh, some of the members of the technical committee of these uh, sports I'm speaking about, saying that the trainings, the back and forths, the new things learned did enhance the performance of the athletes. Not to say these athletes have not been doing well, but that extra has done fantastic. So how do we come up top of the medal uh, uh, chart or rank at number one? Consistency. We have to indeed apply the proper and appropriate techniques. We have to address these things as they are. Yes, I accept that it may not have been like this you know, for, uh, uh, for a while, but now we are intentional. The Honorable Minister of Sports is intentional, is deliberate. And I must also say that besides areas, he said in his recent uh, release that, and his recent conver uh, conversations with gentlemen of the press, that there are areas of stress because there's going to be an audit of the performance of Team Nigeria at the African Games. Areas of strength that he thinks Nigeria can do well naturally, like swimming. Now, why can't Nigeria get medals in swimming? Because he thinks, now we, we want to sit down, we want to audit these things. Are there new areas we've been doing well in, we've done well in athletics, boxing, weightlifting, and you know, wrestling. How about swimming? So we are going to consolidate on those areas that yes, we do very well in. And of course, we are going to look at the areas that Nigerians are naturally endowed with. You notice that uh, those who rank number one at the medal tables, they have their areas of concentration, their areas of strength. You may not never see most of them in athletics. So now what we are trying to do is look inward. What are the areas that Team Nigeria can do? And that is what the sports minister hopes to do in auditing the, the, the just concluded 13th African Games that took place in Accra. And I'm hoping that when this is done, we are going to come up. It's possible. It's possible to be well, number one of the medal. We, you know. we, we the minister is very optimistic. We so took yes, part in 25 of the events and also in the demonstration events. And uh, we have won 20 uh, medals. But, okay, tell the minister that he's doing well in uh, Mr. Macaroni's uh, voice. But uh, we want him to do more. But let me ask you about allowances. Now, there's this story about okay. the athletes being asked to bring BVN, bring NIN, bring their mother's uh, marriage certificate before they can be paid. Tell us, you know, are they going to get paid? Are they already bringing their <laughs> life, entire life history before they can get their allowances? 
Dr. Abati, please permit me to chuckle a little bit at the fact that you said they should bring their mother's marriage certificate or birth certificate. Now, I'd explain uh, as I can. When the, 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 uh, when the 13th African Games co commence, the minister was at the Games Village uh, at, uh, in Accra, and he had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the intention to address every concern now, these are some of, the, some of the things he addressed. Of course, the athletes, um, I would say in my words now, had their trust bro broken by past experiences. You know, they were concerned about their allowances. But as I speak, camp allowances have been paid. Uh, games allowances have been paid. We have, we have athletes testifying to that. And also bonuses. Those who have won, the, the, the games just concluded and those who won medals would receive their bonuses. Now, why were they asked to bring their BVN, their account numbers, and much of those details? What has happened in this, uh, in this uh, season with the minister is that nobody is paying the athletes individually for transparency and so that the right things will be done. And the minister has consistently said that no athletes will be shortchanged. They will get their due. So the payments were done through the CBN. And of course, you know that you must follow the process. And so that's what happened. And the athletes have at least, they are getting, they've gotten their, their camp allowance, their uh, games allowance and now the bonuses will start coming in because you know we had to finish the games and know those who are eligible to get you know their bonuses. Okay, before I let you go, uh, Diana Merrins, and uh, when is the party after party? Would there be a reception? Yeah. Where is the jollofing and pepper souping uh, reception? Um, right now, I think we are just mar marinating in the fact that. Um, uh, a couple of things have happened. Uh, at least we got a couple of, uh, at least even if it's one or two medals more, an improvement to the last one. And also that we broke a couple of jenks. We had a medal in handball, hasn't happened in a long time. We got a medal in swimming, happens, hasn't happened in a long time. And we see that our 40 is coming up. I mean, in, 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 in a game, in boxing, we had 10 athletes and we had eight gold medals and two silver medals. Quite impressive, if you say. Athletics, I mean, for those of us who were there, or the, our, our sisters across the continent were saying Nigerians, you guys are all over the place. For the pepper souping and the jollofing and all of the fantastic time, let us marinate first in, an, in what has happened. We are indeed happy. And uh, possibly, Dr. Ruben, I would revert on when the pepper souping. <laughs> <laughs> and all of the party after party will take place. Thank you very much, Diana <laughs> Mirins, and special advisor to Nigeria's Minister of Sports. And congratulations uh, to special the Nigerian assistant, contingent. Special assistant, media, uh, Dr. Well, Ruben. assistant advisor is the same thing. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you for joining me on the program. Okay, now let's come back to the studio. Uh, Professor Awura, I know you are a sports enthusiast. Yes, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's nice. Um, the athletes that went did well. Um, uh, it could have been worse, it could have been third. We were third at some point. Mm. Before we, uh, South Africa was second at some point, we were third. Mm. Then we won more medals and then Nigeria overtook South Africa and then maintained that position all through. Uh, so that's good, but um, Nigeria should do better. Nigeria's population is more than twice that of Egypt. Yeah. Egypt won 12 million, Nigeria maybe uh, 222 two, two, as at last count, maybe 225, 226. Two, twice Egypt's population. So um, we shouldn't be perpetual uh, second uh, uh, position, uh, you know, all the, you know, up to now. Uh, and you, there's a point you made, which you also uh, talked about, the fact that where we, where we have an advantage now, we need to sustain it and then we need to expand. What stops us from swim? There's so many medals in swimming. The fact that we are jubilating that we won a couple of medals, maybe one or two medals in swimming, it speaks to what we have not done right. Yeah. And that is that there are many sports in which we could develop and do very well that we have not focused on. We need to focus on that, maintain where we are, and then expand uh, you know, to sports that we have an advantage in that we have not tapped into. If we do that, of course, it, it, it will be easy for us to catch up with Egypt. Uh, in the next uh, couple of games. Okay. Uh, if Professor Akintenwa is uh, there in the Abuja studio, Prof, I would like to come back to you to comment very quickly on the uh, UN Security Council resolution uh, on uh, Gaza and also uh, sports. I, I know sports is not that, you know, international relations is your forte. 
uh, Prof. You know, for as, for as long as uh, sports go along with uh, jollofing, uh, pe pursuits all along, why shouldn't I be interested too? <laughs> but let, let me begin, first of all, with the issue of um, the UN um, resolution on um, ceasefire. Um, the question I want to ask you in particular, uh, Dr. Abati, is that who really wants ceasefire in Gaza? Who? Which country really wants that? The issue is that if um, the United States, <laughs> if, the Unit, if the United States has come up with uh, uh, a resolution, after having voted or vetoed three times efforts uh, made to, to have a ceasefire, what prompted it now? Now, there is the need to differentiate between calling for ceasefire and demanding for ceasefire. They are not the same thing. In the way there is a minor uh, misunderstanding between who is a special assistant, who is a special advisor. So, so in this case, I want to say that the, the draft, if China, Russia um, were against, for instance, uh, if they vetoed the, the resolution, is because of what they have given us reason. They say that the draft never mentioned Israel's responsibility. Mm -hmm. And they are now saying that, yes, in, uh, in, in, in rounding up, the, the critical issue is that I do not believe anyone, including the United States, is interested in what it has brought forward for voting, simply well, because the no ultimate problem. objective of Israel, as made clear, is simply total destruction of uh, Hamas, Hamas yeah. the Palestinian Hamas. Mm. And that is the driving. On that note, uh, Prof, uh, um, let me just uh, allow Professor Killer to have, uh, you know, 30 seconds. So well, that will go. Justin Sport, 30 seconds, uh, you know, very welcome. I, well, congratulations to the sports people. It's a very welcome idea that we're doing strategic management in sports. I think the achievements are good, but they're not as much as one would have hoped for with the new approach. Let's hope the new approach continues and we go that way. Strategic management in sport is a very crucial thing that can bring medals and revenue and tie the country together. So well done to the minister. Let's hope they continue this way seriously. It's a good thing that the SA was able to say categorically, we have paid. That is the kind of answer we want for the new well, Nigeria. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Anthony Kila. Thank you, Professor David Awurawo. And thank you, uh, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Akinten. Well, good to see you again, Prof. <laughs> we hope we'll be seeing you every week. You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show. Here on Arise News, I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now. And thank you very much for watching.